Okay, uh, let's get started. In the last uh, time we met, we talked about the linearization process. <coughs> uh, dy dt equals f of y, where y is a vector of uh, any dimension. Okay. <coughs> And so we we linearize it, and we get dy prime dt equals the Jacobian j y prime. Now j here is the matrix of all partial derivatives. So df dy in the compact notation we just indicated as the derivative of the vector function with respect to the vector state. So it's actually a matrix. Uh, that is arranged uh, <coughs> con consisting of all partial derivatives. Now, we took a two dimensional example and saw how would the eigen values determine the stability. So, in general, what th the way that we determine the stability to small perturbations is linearized. So, we look at y prime as small perturbations around a steady state. So, this, this is applied around a steady state. Okay. The solution that we are going to propose is of the form y prime is some vector times e to the power lambda t. Okay, that's the proposal for a solution, and we want to find out whether we can satisfy that differential equation with this proposed solution. And that's typically the way that we construct solutions for differential equations. So if you take this at now I'm showing it for an n-dimensional case. Okay, so if you take this and plug it in there y hat is a vector and we will give it an interpretation for it pretty soon okay and it must be consistent so the left hand side is a vector so the right hand side must be a vector but lambda is a scalar number equal to lambda t is a scalar function of time so when you plug this on the left hand side you are going to get y hat as a constant vector and when you take the derivative you are going to get lambda e to the power lambda t and on the right hand side you have j this is a matrix and then you are going to substitute once again for y prime so that's going to give you y hat e to the power lambda t. All we are doing is substituting the proposed solution into that and then seeing whether we can satisfy the differential equation. And what you will find is that e to the power lambda t appears on both sides. I can cancel that out. And so I will have y hat lambda as a vector equals j y hat. And this is what we call the eigenvalue problem. So there are certain values of lambda that will be satisfied by this equation. Now this equation we can rearrange it also as j minus i lambda times y hat because y hat appears on both sides. So you can move it to one side and say that must be equal to zero. Okay, then you can ask the question under what condition can I get a non-trivial solution? And that would be when the determinant of j minus i lambda, you set that equal to zero. <coughs> Otherwise, if that determinant is not zero, the only solution possible is y hat is equal to zero. Okay? So, but if the determinant is zero, then you can get y hat to be uh, non-trivial. So, this is an n-dimensional system. So, there will be n eigenvalues. Lambda i, i going from one to n. The same ideas apply later on when you're solving differential equations, for example, you will have eigenfunctions. Here, what happens is this eigenvector, we, we give this the meaning of an eigenvector. The vector operates on j to produce another vector. <coughs> I guess I already changed the symbol on you already. No, I call it j. Okay, j is my Jacobian matrix. So, a matrix is basically an operator, a rule for multiplication. So, if you take a vector and multiply it with the uh, vector, it produces a new vector. Okay. So, uh, a matrix is uh, it transforms one vector into another vector, but in the case of eigenvector, the matrix leaves the vector unchanged, and that's why it's called a unique vector, an eigenvector. And uh, to, if you want to see a physical interpretation, uh, there is actually a very beautiful movie in MATLAB. Let me see whether I can start that. Have you guys seen that? Any of you seen that? Eigen? Okay. <coughs> 
I mean, these pictures are nice to have in your mind for a two-dimensional case, but when you are extending it to a n-dimensional case, you need to do it only algebraically. There's no geometrical way of rendering that. So I think there is a function called EAG show. Okay. <coughs> and it has a number of matrices, two by two matrices that you can play with, but there is a default one. Okay. So in this case, there is a matrix A that is defined by 1, 3, 4, 2 in the uh, two by two matrix <coughs> divided by 4. So if you take a vector x and multiply it by that matrix, it produces a new vector Ax. Okay. And that vector geometrically looks like that. So the blue one is the resultant of operation of A on X. Okay. But what they have done also nicely is you can grab this and move it around. As you move around, you see what happens to the resultant vector. Okay. So you just go around on a unit circle. So the vector that you pick is on a unit circle, meaning its length is 1. Okay. But what do you see? It has taken the set of vectors that lie on the unit circle and mapped it into a ellipse. So it has distorted it, but it mapped, mapped it into ellipse. If A were I, what would happen? It will be on, blue also will be a circle. Okay. If it is A is an identity matrix, blue will also be a circle. So any other A simply distorts the circle into an ellipse. And there is a theorem, I think, in linear algebra that shows that this is what will do. Okay. Now, if you continue this and watch, there is one particular position. What happens there? X and AX are aligned in the same direction, except the length of the vector is stretched. And that ratio is your eigenvalue lambda. Lambda is nothing but the scale factor by which the vector is uh, stretched. Okay. And we can ask the question, how many such eigenvectors are likely to be there for a 2 by 2 system? So you have found, this is called the principal direction also, okay, another way of looking at that. <coughs> okay, so if you take around, there it is, another vector, okay, and should these two vectors be perpendicular, th th that gets tricky, okay. So you can show that these two vectors will be orthogonal if you have a matrix uh, that is uh, symmetric. If you have non-symmetric matrix, then the eigenvectors, the set of eigenvectors that you calculate are not necessarily orthogonal to each other, but there is something called a left eigenvector and a right eigenvector. They are called biorthogonal, which means the set of eigenvectors that you have uh, from the right side will be perpendicular to the set of vectors that you have from the left side. Okay. So at least the, the, I just saw this last night. I was thinking about what am I going to talk today, and I, I saw. You still learn. MATLAB is particularly a great tool for visual representation of this. <coughs> okay, so the eigenvectors are nothing but unique vectors which leave the vector untransformed. So it leaves the direction of the eigenvector is the same when you operate it on A. Okay, so it leaves the vector except for a scale factor. And uh, <coughs> you, you have to imagine when you're increasing this to a multidimensional case that there's going to be a hypersphere and a hyper ellipse. And there was still the concept of these uh, eigenvectors leaving the uh, product unchanged, that still is valid. Okay. So if you look at uh, this equation, so a unique vector when operated on J gives you back the same vector except for a scale factor eigenvalue. Okay. That's a geometrical interpretation that you give. And how do you calculate that? There are algorithms for calculating it in MATLAB and there are the problem, the, from stability point of view, what do we want? Why do we want to know about these eigenvalues? Because we want all the eigenvalues to be, the real part of the eigenvalues to be negative because we're dealing with perturbations and we want the perturbations to die out. So we should know where these eigenvalues are located in the complex plane. Okay. <coughs> and uh, So we saw in the last class that these eigenvectors are say y1 hat and y2 hat in a two-dimensional case. And if I have my uh, starting point in different location, the trajectories, that's a, if they are both negative, it will be an attractor. Okay. 
So it's going to just go into that and which direction it goes is going to depend on the magnitude of lambda 1 and lambda 2 because they determine how fast they decay. Okay? And this is the basic idea behind uh, normal mode analysis. You can think of each eigen modes as, as a mode and if you for example leave the initial condition exactly at one point we said that you are not including disturbances for the other modes. So even if you have an unstable mode, if you pick your initial condition on the stable mode, it will just be attracted along that. But slightest perturbation will cause it to leave. So sometimes they call these in math mathematical language manifolds, stable manifold and unstable manifold. These are basically a collection of if you have 10 eigenvalues that are positive and 20 eigenvalues that are negative, you have a, sta a stable manifold of sub dimension 20 and an unstable manifold of sub dimension 10. So if your initial condition is contained only in the stable manifold, then it will likely to be attracted to it as long as you ensure that there is no perturbations on that, that it accidentally doesn't get excited by any of the unstable modes. But in reality, it will always get excited by that. <coughs> okay, so what we need to do is actually plot these eigenvalues. So now what I'm plotting is real part of lambda and imaginary part of lambda. And I want all the eigenvalues that I've calculated, when I plot them, they're going to be just discrete points in here. Okay? If I have 100 by 100 the equation, 100 dimensional equation, I will have 100 eigenvalues. I can locate where they are. And I want all of them to be populated on the left hand side. Okay? So when, when does the instability occur? For example, if I have only real eigenvalues, there is no complex part. So all the eigenvalues are actually living on this line. Okay? But as I change a parameter in the problem, one of the eigenvalues goes to the goes to the right hand side. Okay? So if it crosses the left half plane and moves into the right half plane, then I have instability. Okay? So it can cross like this or it can cross like that. Those are special cases or it can cross like this. <coughs> so each one here will give rise to different type of bifurcations. Okay? So the stability changes often when stability changes, something else happens to the nonlinear dynamics. This is a linear stability, but whenever uh, instability, there is a change in stability, the full nonlinear system has to respond in some other way. So the, there are many names for these kinds of singularities. In fact, when the eigenvalue is exactly zero, what happens to the determinant? the determinant of j. What the way that we calculate these eigenvalues is by ensuring that the determinant of j minus lambda i is equal to 0. So if I take all the values of lambda that are calculated in the left half plane and put it into this equation, it's going to be 0 because I satisfy that to be 0. But if I <coughs> take the, for that particular value of lambda where the lambda is equal to 0, it's going through stability change. Okay, and it's an important idea to uh, under grasp because we are going to impose this condition when asking, reversing the question and saying, okay, for what value of the parameter is the eigenvalue equal to zero? Right now what we are saying is when the lambda is equal to zero, what happens to the determinant of j? Is zero. Okay. So that is a detection that you can use. You can actually uh, solve the problem in, in Navier-Stokes equation, you are changing Reynolds number and at a certain critical value of the Reynolds number, the eigenvalue associated with that particular state, one of them goes to zero. If exactly one goes to zero, the determinant is going to zero. So we can monitor the determinant and see if the determinant is going to change sign. And if it changes sign, that means it's likely to go through one eigenvalue is likely to go through zero. Okay. And uh, so in the case of a simple limit point, there is a theorem that simply says, that, I mean, mathematicians define to put precision in there. So a simple limit point is defined as one where there is exactly one eigenvalue that goes through zero. That means if there are two eigenvalues that go to three zero, you would have a higher order singularity. So the determinant of the Jacobian becomes singular and the degree of singularity determines the degree of the bifurcation that we can have. <coughs> and if this condition occurs, and I will give you an example of this, that is there are a pair of eigenvalues that are crossing from the left half plane to the right half plane. So at the point where they cross, what happens? We have a pair of 
purely imaginary eigenvalues. There is no real part to it. Okay. For any value of Reynolds number less than that, so I am parameterizing these curves. So the way I would do that is it's a very difficult computation. I would locate all the eigenvalues for a steady state at a certain Reynolds number. Then I increase the Reynolds number. All these eigenvalues will move in the left half plane as I change the parameter. So I will get a curve. Okay. So I need to try. I don't really care about all the eigenvalues. I care about those eigenvalues that are near this edge or are they are likely to go to the right hand side to determine where the stability is. And when this occurs, this kind of a transition occurs, that's called the Hopf bifurcation. Okay. So you, that is in fact the condition for a Hopf bifurcation is that you must have a pair of purely imaginary eigenvalues. If, you, if the parameter is small, you have a real part, but the real part is negative, so it's stable. If you go to the right, there is a real part, but the real part is positive, so it's an unstable system. Okay. So right on there, if you can find that parameter where you have a pair of purely imaginary eigenvalues, you have found a half bifurcation point. Similarly, if you have found a simple eigenvalue to be equal to zero, then you have found a limit point. So these are the conditions that are used to extend. Now, if I have 10,000 equations, to calculate 10,000 eigenvalues is a tremendous challenge because it's a very highly computationally intensive part. MATLAB has a routine called EIG. For 10 by 10, 20 by 20, 100 by 100, it will do it very fast. But if you throw 10,000 by 10,000, imagine 10,000 by 10,000 is almost 1 million elements in a matrix that you need to store. And each number is going to take 8 bytes. So you are approaching 1, 8 megabytes of storage already for that. And it goes a square. So if you have 100,000 by 100,000, uh, out of memory most of the time. Okay. So uh, that's why high performance computing is addressing these challenges. How can I develop efficient methods for solving large dimensional systems? You might ask, where do we come across large, such large high dimensional systems? Where do we come across 100,000 equations? But a lot of you have, when you discretize your equations, what do you get? It's easily million equations. Okay, and uh, remember the dynamical equation. If you take the navier stokes equation, you are looking at the stability. You need to keep the dynamical part, and so you, that's how you convert a partial differential equation into a truncated ordinary differential equation. And so you end up with really large number of ordinary differential equations. And so calculating these eigenvalues is a very uh, challenging task. There are efficient algorithms. One of the things that you will do is, if you notice that if I have a complex function f of z, and if I take, I think, and this is I'm doing by memory, if I take this function 1 plus z, so z is a complex variable. So it could represent typically an eigenvalue, for example, eigenvalues of could be complex numbers. So if I take this mapping, that is, and the mapping is basically a function. So I put in a value of z and I calculate f of z. <coughs> if I do that, um, I will notice that the entire left half plane, meaning if z lies anywhere on the left half plane, that will be mapped into a unit circle. This function, the role of this function is to take that and map into a unit circle. This I'm doing it from memory, so I'm not sure whether the plus and minus I have it in the right position, I think I probably have because as z goes to infinity, <coughs> this goes to 0 and you need to check the sign. Okay, um, So you can use a transformation in uh, matrix language. So you construct a new matrix B, which is going to be uh, something like 1 plus z, uh, sorry, j, 1 plus j inverse multiplied by 1 minus j. 1 instead of 1 it becomes identity matrix. Okay. <coughs> so it is, this function is inspired by f of z. What f of z does is maps the left half plane into a unit circle. So instead of finding the eigenvalues of j, if I find the eigenvalues of b, what should happen? All the, if all the eigenvalues of j are in the left half plane, all the eigenvalues of B should be in the unit circle. Okay. Then all I need to do is <coughs> construct the matrix B, of course, first, and then calculate the eigenvalues within the unit circle. Again, calculating all the eigenvalues is going to be a lot of problem. But I know that if one of the eigenvalue escapes to the right hand side, that eigenvalue must escape the unit circle. 
Okay. So all I need to do is look for the largest magnitude eigenvalue because it's going to be unit circle is one. So if an eigen magnitude of the eigenvalue becomes greater than one, that's going to escape. So it's a quick way of detecting those eigenvalues that are on the border and that are going to escape. So you don't have to compute all the eigenvalues, you need to compute only the largest eigenvalues. And there are efficient ways of doing that as well. And uh, there is time, I guess we will talk about those things as the lectures progress. Any questions so far? A unit circle is a circle in the complex plane that has a radius of 1. Okay. Its magnitude uh, must be 1. So, unit circle is a circle with radius of 1 that is in the complex plane. So, when I calculate the eigenvalues of B, all these eigenvalues that are in the left half plane that you see there will be mapped inside that. Okay, And when any eigenvalue escapes, it will escape the unit circle. So, all I need to do is look for the largest eigenvalues because I do not care about those that are in the middle, they are all stable. <laughs> so, that is the idea of a unit, uh, unit circle. <coughs> so, the reason why we, when, when we do this to differential equations instead of eigenvectors, you will have eigenfunctions and the J will be instead of a matrix operator, it will be a differential operator, okay. But the ideas are uh, normally easily generalized. Again, you have the linear is a nonlinear differential equation, okay. So, you have to look at linear differential equations and convert that into an eigenvalue problem and then you can determine the stability. <coughs> okay, so far we have been talking uh, qualitatively with that uh, uh, rod deflection problem, but let us look at quantitatively simple canonical examples, examples that captures the basics of what various types of bifurcations are. These are also taken from the book by Dresen. Okay. So, here you have uh, is an example of a fold bifurcation. As we saw, a fold bifurcation is one where if you have a parameter with a state, a state curve may look like this, just uh, a fold point. At a fold point, we need exactly one eigenvalue to be equal to zero. That is a condition that we need to satisfy. Now, if you have a complicated model, our task is to actually construct the entire path of solution and at these singular points, locate where they are exactly. And there are algorithms that we are going to discuss later on. But here, the canonical examples, we actually fix the problem is contrived, it is made up so that you can understand the basic idea, okay. <coughs> so, here you have a single ordinary differential equation with a single parameter A, okay. So, as A changes, the steady state solutions, the number of steady state solutions will change and we want to examine what happens to the uh, stability as well. So, we, we set f of x equal to 0 and when you do that, it is easy to solve x square equals x square minus A under steady state is equal to 0. So, x equals plus or minus square root of A. These are the two solutions. There are two solutions that depend on the parameter A in the problem. Okay, so, as you change the parameter, the two solutions will change. <coughs> so, for a negative number, there is no real solution because square root of minus does not exist, right. So, I mean, it throws us into complex space. So, we are talking about real physical models with real solutions. So, the state must be a real one. <coughs> so, these are the two solutions that you see here plus a and minus a, and a is the parameter x is the state of the system. So, the bifurcation diagram plots the state of the system against a parameter, okay. And you notice that at this point, there is a, a fold bifurcation. It is placed at the origin, okay. <laughs> Typically, that will not be the problem. We will have this replaced by a complicated nonlinear equation with a few parameters and we will have to learn how to solve that and how to track this as the solution changes what happens to the singular points. To determine the stability, all we need to do is linearize that problem, okay. So, here in this case, we have a, a single nonlinear equation, right. So, we need to find j. What would be j? Simply df dx. We have only one function with respect to one variable. So, take its derivative and evaluate it at the steady state, ok. 
Okay, so the Jacobian is evaluated at the steady state, <coughs> and when you do that, you will find that it is equal to minus two x s. But that is going to be the eigenvalue because we have just a scalar case. Okay, so those will be the eigenvalue, and the solution will be given as e to the power minus two x s t. Okay, now you can answer the question: Is it going to be stable or unstable? There are two solutions, right? <coughs> so if you put x s is equal to plus square root of a. What happens to the eigenvalue? Always negative. So that's going to be the stable solution. Okay. So, so that is the stable one. When x is equal to plus square root of a, when x is equal to minus square root of a, the other solution will become positive when you substitute in there. The minus and minus cancel, so the eigenvalue becomes and remains positive as you increase a. So that solution is going to be labeled as unstable. And at x at a equal to zero, what happens to that? At a equal to zero, x is zero. The eigenvalue is zero. So the change of stability occurs as the eigenvalue goes from the negative to the positive side, as we saw before. Okay, does it make sense? Uh, <coughs> uh, a second, we saw this also qualitatively. What is the pitchfork bifurcation? So we know. That in this phase the picture must look something like this. Okay, there is a critical value, and uh, this is stable. That's unstable. This is stable. This is stable. But you you can also have a situation where you have the pitchfork pointing like this. Okay, supercritical and subcritical uh, pitchfork bifurcation. Here is an example, a concrete example that illustrates. Now we have two parameters in the problem. A and B are parameters. <coughs> a can be positive or negative, but we are restricting. B to be positive. You can later on examine what would happen if B is negative. Okay, there is a uh, image of that behavior. It will turn out that B equal to positive will give you this, and B equal to negative will give you the subcritical uh, application. So we take this function as usual. We set that equal to zero and solve for the steady state. Okay, <coughs> now it's a cubic equation. Okay, so you can excess factor out. So x is equal to zero is one steady state solution, and then you'll be left with uh, uh, a minus b x squared, which you can also solve, and that will give you the other two solutions plus or minus square root of a over b. Remember, a is positive, but b can be. I mean, a, a can be anything, but b has to be positive. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> then we consider the linearized model. So we linearize the function again. It's a single equation, so you can take its derivative. That's your Jacobian. And the Jacobian has to be evaluated at those steady states, all those three steady states that we have mapped out. <coughs> the diagram for this looks like this: the steady state that corresponds to the first one is there for all values of a, because I mean, as we said, a can be positive or negative. Okay, <coughs> so it exists. Uh, x is equal to zero. That's a solution that exists for all values. Okay, the other solution is x is equal to plus or minus square root of u over a. Okay. And those give you this part of the branch and this part of the branch. But it doesn't exist for b less than zero. That's why we ruled out uh, if b. I mean, we ruled out b because. <coughs> let me go back to that. Maybe I'm going too fast. Okay, the solution is b a over b, right? <coughs> By ruling out uh, restricting b to be greater than zero and a to be Anything when a is negative, this solution doesn't exist. Real solution doesn't exist. Okay, and that's why that solution just has a parabolic part that goes only forward. So it is like like this. Okay, this solution doesn't exist below that. But the solution that exists for all values of a is this solution. Okay, so we need to examine what is the stability of this solution as well as what is the stability of the other two solutions. <coughs> So when you substitute x is equal to zero, um, what was the solution? X is equal to zero in the Jacobian. Okay, so x is equal to zero in the Jacobian. You get a as your eigenvalue. So when a is negative, it is stable. When a is positive, it is unstable. That's why the stability changes 
at this point for this solution. We are looking at only that solution because we have substituted only x is equal to 0 in the linearized Jacobian. Okay. The next thing that you need to do is take the same uh, Jacobian but substitute the next solution that is uh, plus or minus square root of a over b and then simplify that. Okay. So, when you simplify that <coughs> you will get uh, here it is okay. you will get minus 2a. Okay. <coughs> Um, so, in this case, this solution exists only for a greater than 0. These two solutions exist only for a greater than 0. That means both the solutions are stable. So, this is stable and that is stable. Okay. Now, if you examine the case where b is negative, you will find you get the subcritical pitchfork bell equation. <coughs> so, once again, the condition that needs to be satisfied here is there should be an eigenvalue that goes through 0, but there is an extra condition that because we cannot have the same condition for two different types of applications. Okay. So, as I said, this one occurs normally when there is a symmetry breaking in the physical problem. So, there is an extra condition that we need to place <coughs> that the eigenvectors corresponding to the anti symmetric mode are perpendicular. There is a additional complication that we will see later on, but the basic idea is this allows us to identify the condition at the singular point and the nature of the solution around the singular point. So, this again will be considered as a singular point, but a different type of singular point. You can consider it as a fold if you consider only this path, but if you consider the total solution, it is a pitch fold. Now, we go from one equation to two equations, okay, where other interesting possibilities can occur. <coughs> so, here we have two two dimensional system and there is a single parameter a in there. x and y are the states, okay, a two dimensional system. So, you need to linearize it the same way, construct the Jacobian which is the partial derivative of this is your f1 and this is your f2, okay. So, using the definition take the derivative. Now, by inspection you can tell in general case you have to take these two nonlinear equations and solve them for the steady state, set them equal to 0 and solve. You could have many, many solutions for that as the parameter changes. Okay. So, you have to in this particular case, the only solution that we are going to we do not know whether other solutions exist. That is one of the still unresolved problems. If you give me a nonlinear equation and ask me the question, how many solutions are there for that nonlinear equation? Forget about the parameter, just a nonlinear equation, and ask the question, how many steady states are there that will satisfy the nonlinear equation? Can you tell me a priori? There is no theory that will do that. Okay. So, the number of solutions is still an unknown, <coughs> but the bifurcation theory allows you to kind of, if you have located one solution, track the path of the solutions, locate the singular points and construct uh, a little bit of uh, the puzzle, <coughs> not the complete puzzle. Okay. So, in this case, we, we know that there is one solution by simply inspection. If I put x equal to 0, y equal to 0, both the functions are 0. So, that is a, a steady state solution. So, I calculate all the partial derivatives and put x equal to 0, y equal to 0, I get my Jacobian 2 by 2 matrix. So, this will have two eigenvalues. Okay. The eigenvalues are going to depend on the parameter A. Okay. So, I need to change the parameter and see what happens to the eigenvalue for various values of the parameter. So, I need to, I mean you can still do this in paper. Um, so, here is your linearized equation and here is your analytical expression for the eigenvalue, okay, because it is a quadratic you can still solve it analytically and that is a plus or minus square root of i. So, what happens when a is negative? The real part of the eigenvalue is negative that means it is going to perturbation is going to decay. So, it is a stable system. <coughs> for lambda equal to 0, I mean for a equal to 0, I should say a, a equal to 0 we have a pair of purely imaginary eigenvalues and that is the condition for the origin of a half bifurcation. Okay. And for a greater than 0, the solution continues to exist that x equal to 0, y equal to 0, the steady state continues to exist. So, if I have to plot this, 
For example, I plot A here and the state space X and the state space Y. Okay. So if I take a plane for a constant A, A equals minus 5 for example, the state space is going to live in that plane. So if I take a steady state from there, I mean an initial condition from there, I know it's stable. So it's going to be attracted to the origin. Origin is my solution. Okay. But if I do the same thing to the right hand side, a plane where A equal to 5, the origin is not stable. That's all I can say. Where does it go? The answer should be maybe there are other steady state solutions to which it can go. We have seen examples of that. Or as in this case, there is something called a limit cycle, a closed traje trajectory. So if I take a plane for A equal to 5, there would be a closed trajectory. Okay. So if I start anywhere outside with the initial condition, it may go around it, but it should merge with the trajectory and then go on the trajectory forever. Okay. And that is a limit cycle. So you don't get a steady state, but you get an equilibrium state that is bounded, but periodic. Okay. Very well defined periodicity. So if I start inside, if I start even close, to my other steady state x equal to 0, y equal to 0, because it is unstable, the trajectory will go, go from there and go to the periodic circle again. Okay. So that is the, so this plane is the birth of a limit cycle and uh, the amplitude of the limit cycle will keep on growing like this as you increase a. So, <coughs> So this is how it's going to look like. So this is a limit cycle and any trajectory that starts inside winds outside and combines with that. Any trajectory that you start outside also comes and joins with that. Okay. <coughs> because it's a contrived problem, it actually turns out to be a nice circle. In general, it won't be. It would be a closed curve, but it could be a very complicated curve. So if I have a circle, what would the time series look like? It's going to be, you're starting somewhere, it goes there, and then it's a pure sine wave or a cosine wave or something like that. We can get back to that. But if the limit cycle is in the plane, it looks like this. Okay. Remember the time is parameterized on that curve. So I can take that and plot it. This is in the state space x, y. The time series for that, <coughs> when I'm plotting either x or y, could be something like this, but it should repeat itself. Now, when even that does not happen, that is when you get chaos. Okay, When you go to from two dimensional system to three dimensional system, the trajectory is bounded in some space in the state space, but it does not form a closed trajectory. Then it looks like when you plot the time series, it looks completely chaotic. Okay. <coughs> we will see an example of that later on, but continuing on this, This tells us that this linearized state is unstable, okay, and there is a pair of purely imaginary axes, but it does not tell us what happens to the full nonlinear system. And that is where analytically we cannot really probe any further. We need to resolve into numerics in general. But in this particular case, because it is a contrived example, built example that illustrates the point, we can actually make a simple transformation, okay, from the Cartesian frame xy coordinate of the state space go to cylindrical reference frame with x equal to r cos theta or something like that. In, in the three-dimensional case, you mentioned that it will be a closed surface. The, like in the two-dimensional case, <coughs> we have seen a closed curve. No, if you have a limit cycle in the three-dimensional case, I mean, remember, when you go to three-dimension, four-dimension, five-dimension, you can still have a steady state. So in that space, a steady state would be just a point. Yes. You can still have a limit cycle. In that space, the limit cycle will still be a closed curve, but spanning all three dimensions, but it will be a closed curve, okay, a limit cycle. But a chaotic one will not be a closed circle, it will span a sub subspace of that. And uh, when you see the Lorentz attractor, you will see, you can ask the question, is that subspace going to be a plane? In general, the answer is no, okay. They call it as a space filling curve. Okay, so it fill, the curve just continues to go on and fills the space. So this is where fra uh, fractals come in. So you can then ask the question: What is the fractional dimension of the subspace where this strange attractor lives? People have calculated that, 
So it could be a two dimensional one and a five, three dimensional case. Lorentz attractor turns out to be like that. And people have calculated its dimension to be something like 2.05. So you now need to go into fractional dimension ideas that come from fractals. But if you make this transformation and you'll find that the two equations become uncoupled. Previously they were coupled, right? By that I mean the first equation depends both on xy and the second equation depends both on xy. But if you make this transformation x equals r cos theta y equals r sin theta on that equation, you'll find that there is an equation only in terms of r. Theta doesn't appear at all in that. And the second equation has just theta, r doesn't appear. In fact, second equation is very trivial, you can integrate that. Even the first equation, you can separate and integrate that. So you can get an analytical result for the complete nonlinear trajectory. We are not, now we have gone past determining the stability from the linearized version. So now we are going to construct what is the nonlinear path. Okay. So theta it is simply changing with time, starting from some initial condition theta zero, and r is changing in this complicated fashion. <coughs> okay. Now that is the part that decays. <coughs> and as t goes to infinity, what happens to this trajectory? If you understand that, you will see what happens, okay? So if the part that has the exponential part with time is e to the power minus 2 a t, remember a is positive. So as t goes to infinity, that's going to decay. That part, this entire part will drive to 0 as t goes to infinity. So then the r0 cancels out. So you get the solution as a. They have fixed the problem in such a way that it has a very nice amplitude of a, which is the same value as the parameter. So, if the radius of this is the same as a, and what you have to imagine is that at every plane I have a circle like that with its radius equal to the parameter value of a, okay, starting at this point, okay, and that is how you typically represent a half bifurcation point as this kind of a parabolic dish that comes out, but it, it need not be a parabola, it need not, need not be a nice circle. <coughs> the limit cycle uh, trajectory could be co quite complicated, but you understand what happens at this critical point where there is a half point and the limit cycle is born, <coughs> okay. <coughs> yeah, we already talked about this, this is uh, a simple full type of a bifurcation where a pure real eigenvalue crosses from the left to right and this is an example of a half bifurcation where a pair of eigenvalues go through uh, the left half plane to the right half plane. And we already talked about <coughs> uh, how to <coughs> calculate those eigenvalues. So we now look at a three dimensional case. So in a two dimensional case as I said at the very beginning of the series. If n equal to 2, we know a lot about those nonlinear systems, no matter what is the degree of nonlinearity, because those trajectories live in a two dimensional space. Okay? So, the only possible solutions are either steady states or a closed limit cycle. You cannot have, for example, you cannot have when you have two dimensional system in the state space xy, okay? you cannot have a trajectory that does this. <coughs> Why? Why can't a trajectory be wandering in that space? Okay, uh, there is a theorem that uh, I think it's called poincare bendixson theorem or something like that. Uh, that will prove this. But conceptually, it's very easy to understand if you accept the very first statement that we made in this course. If I have an equation uh, dy dt equals f of y, and ask the question: Does it is is the existence of solution for that known? Is it guaranteed? The answer is yes. Okay. By that solution to that, I mean the trajectory, entire trajectory y as a function of time. So, if as long as this function is continuous, so there is a condition called Lipschitz continuous, that function is unique. If that is unique, this kind of a thing it will automatically rule out. Why? Because if I take my steady state at a point of intersection, is the flow going to be like this or is it going to be like this? It introduces a non uniqueness. Okay. Because the entire curve we are saying satisfies that differential equation. So you cannot have an ambiguity. So it's not possible to have an intersection in a two dimensional case. You can have either steady state or you can have closed limit cycle. 
Okay, limit cycle is not a problem because there is only one solution everywhere. Whatever, if you put the initial condition on there, you are already setting it on the limit cycle and just keep on going. Okay, but that is not true in the three dimensional case. <coughs> you could have a curve that does not intersect at all, it does not violate the uh, existence of solution, but just goes nearby, nearby, and continues, never closing on itself. And that problem was first accidentally discovered by Lorentz. Okay, so it is called the Lorentz. Uh, Lorentz was actually an environmental scientist at MIT and the equations are derived from Navier-Stokes equation and the energy equation. He was an atmospheric scientist so he was looking at uh, atmospheric uh, motions and uh, I will pick up a similar example to give you an idea of how these equations are developed from a more complicated Navier-Stokes model. How can you develop three simple looking <laughs> equations that have a very complicated behavior? And there are nice books on, on this. The one is that the entire book is devoted to Lorentz equation. This was done, discovered in 1963, and I think this book came out in 1980, I think. So there was a lot of work between that time, and this book uh, basically uh, categorizes, summarizes. It's written in a very mathematical language by a mathematician, and so is this one um, New Methods of Chaotic Dynamics by two Russian. Uh, mathematicians that came out in 2006 and they actually provide because it is a more recent one, they provide a very beautiful summary of all the states that are possible as a solution to this differential equation. And the differential equation themselves are fairly simple. We have three ordinary differential equations, you have three states x, y and z and you have a number of parameters. PR is the Prandtl number and there is another parameter R these are ratios of properties I think and there is another parameter B. So there are three parameters in the problem, there are three states and the question is what happens to the state as you continuously increase and, and because a lot of mathematicians have gotten involved, there are a lot of analytical solutions that are possible in certain region of the parameter space and they have been mapped out, they have been well known and of course if you go for other regions of the parameter, remember the parameter space itself is going to be three dimensional now. Okay. So, you have really infinitely many problems that you can study by putting different values of the parameter. If you can find a new kind of a behavior, as I said, for a nonlinear problem, you can never get a complete picture. This is how nature hides all its secrets from us. Our job is to go and discover them, uncover them as much as we can. Okay. So, <coughs> For different values of the parameters, you may get different behavior. But the simple sequence, once again, starts like this x equal to 0, y equal to 0, z equal to 0 is a steady state. By inspection, you can see that. If you put that, all the three functions would be 0. Okay. So, starting from that, as you change the parameters, what happens to the solution? <coughs> I have a meeting at 10 o'clock, so I need to shut down very quickly. Um, maybe we will continue with this. Uh, I have pulled out the summary of this behavior uh, from the mathematics book, but this is one of the pictures. It is a time series where we plot x against time. Okay. The story behind apparently is that in the 60s, no, but we did not have all these powerful computers that you guys have now. Maybe there was a computer that was a teleprinter. So, the, he was integrating an ordinary differential equation and left it overnight. To integrate these three ordinary differential equations, you can get the result like this now. But in those days, you let it integrate over overnight, and come back in the next morning, and he sees it's integrated over thousand time units or something. He sees the final three numbers, the x, y, z. Says, okay, I'm going to continue this. So take those three numbers, put it in, okay, and let it integrate over the next night. And what he found, remember, you have a lot of parameters here, right? So in certain parameter range, you find that if he took the six digits that it printed out and he said, okay, I am just going to put three digits, okay, and in the come next day, you will see a completely different picture. And so, that is where the, this idea came in that sensitive dependence on initial condition is an essential character of chaotic systems. If you change your initial condition slightly, you cannot get the same trajectory. The trajectory will live in the same state space, you will go to the same state space, but you will not get exactly the same trajectory because the trajectory can 
continue to fill fill that space. And if you plot the same thing in the form of uh, state space, this is what you get. Okay, and maybe we'll stop there because I have a meeting. So <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't have time to questions. <laughs> but think about it. Maybe next time we'll start off with questions. Okay. <coughs>